Welcome. Welcome everyone. We'll just give it a second as, as folks join us today. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, give me one second. All right, um, I'm gonna hand it to Eric just to start us with some housekeeping and technical uh, notes and then we'll get started. All right, housekeeping and technical notes. Uh, first and foremost, I'm going to be adding some information in the chat here to access the Spanish language. Oh, the interpreters have already done that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, if you have a question that we'd really like answered, please put it into the Q&A function. Uh, go ahead and feel free to use the chat to talk amongst yourselves, but there's going to be a lot of people on this webinar and there's a chance of that getting lost. So if you really want your question being answered, please put it into the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, cares, concerns, please feel free to try and message us and we'll do what we can to assist with that. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Kate, is it back to you or? Yes, back to me. Back to you. All right. All right, welcome everyone. Um, so on this, you should be able to see both the interpreter and myself on the screen as well as uh, the PowerPoint slides. If you have any tech issues, just put it in the chat and we'll do our best um, to support you. Um, well, thanks for joining uh, our webinar training today, uh, which is titled Taking the Mystery Out of Medicaid. Um, my name is Mary Kate Wells. I am the program director at the National Council on Independent Living. Um, Nicole uh, is excited to be collaborating with NACDD, National, National Association of Councils of Developmental Disabilities. We'll do our best with acronyms today. Um, and we're collaborating on this together um, as part of the ACL Grassroots Project. Um, so for folks that don't know, NICL is a, a grassroots organization um, representing uh, centers for independent living, statewide independent living councils, and other advocates and people with disabilities to advance the rights um, of people with disabilities throughout the United States. Um, and I, I believe NACDD will be interested in themselves in just a little bit. Um, we are partnering today on this grassroots project, which aims to uh, position the next generation of cross-disability, cross-generational, and culturally diverse grassroots advocates as leaders and catalysts of system change that holds states and or providers accountable and responsive to input. Um, I'm just going to pause. I see in the chat, I saw, don't see the interpreters. Just let us know if you aren't able to see the interpreters. Um, and I, what I want to emphasize on what this project is about is how we can build advocates for systems change. And the second part of that of how to hold states and providers accountable and responsive to input. So today's webinar. Um, still can't, I'm going to pause one second. We still can't see interpreter. Um, for those folks who are not able to see it, um, you need to change your view to gallery view and you should be able to see folks. Okay. I just wanna make, did that work for you? Okay, great. Awesome, thank you for letting us know. Um, the part that we really wanna emphasize is how uh, advocates at the local level can really hold their states and other stakeholders accountable for um, what people with disabilities need, right? Um, so part of this is providing technical assistance and training to each of our networks to participate in activities such as um, HCBS or home and community-based service waiver renewal processes. 
um, CMS site visits, so Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, or Medicare and Medicaid, um, are doing site visits and, and other uh, processes around Medicaid. Um, we want to support advocates to be able to participate in your state Medicaid processes to ensure that there is consumer control and um, people with disabilities at the table and get their voices heard. Um, and I know that NICL and NACDD is here to support advocates to build their skills and our collective power um, to be really active in this process. So. With that, I am going to hand it over to Jonathan Taylor to tell, talk a little bit more about uh, why we're tackling this option, this uh, topic, and, and can we pause for just a moment? Speaker. Can we pause for mm -hmm. just a moment? I think there's some problem with the Spanish interpreter in the chat. It says there's no interpreter in the Spanish channel, and if you could check the chat, and it should help you out with that. I see that it folks should be able to click on the bottom now. Yes, and um, the speak only the interpreters on screen right now. I'm going to add a uh, spotlight Jonathan. So you're going to see the interpreter and um, Jonathan Taylor. So you can take it away. Thank you, Mary Kay. Um, this webinar on the NACDD side came out of some discussions in the NACDD Medicaid Task Force. Specifically, this came out of some challenges my own council has faced around Medicaid education and advocacy. In my own state, Arkansas, legislators and self-advocates and families rely very heavily on the state's DD service agency for information about Medicaid and waiver programs. While there's nothing inherently wrong with that, the information provided is often a high level view of the entire system, but that's often a view that focuses on how the system is supposed to work, not how it really works, and doesn't always fully incorporate the experiences of advocates living with Medicaid. DD councils and silks can offer a more complete picture of how Medicaid works in their state. And that picture is one we can paint together, not just because we're all part of ACL, it's because we all have the same fundamental mission for people with disabilities to live, work, and play in the communities of their choosing. Um, in my state, I'm fortunate enough to have a strong working relationship with my SOAP director, um, especially during legislative session. And together, we can better educate policymakers about the realities of Medicaid, but more importantly, we can connect people with disabilities and their families to each other. Those who are living life with Medicaid waiver are invaluable guides to those who are just entering the system and they need all the help they can get. And this webinar is intended to be a helpful tool in the process of beginning to understand Medicaid and taking some of the mystery out of it. And so to take some of the mystery out of it, I'd like to introduce our speaker and that is Janine Zalaki. And she's the Director of Technical Assistance and Special Projects for the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services and currently serves as faculty to the National Leadership Consortium on Developmental Disabilities. With nearly 30 years in the field of developmental disabilities, she brings a strong understanding of Medicaid policy, structure, and DD systems. Prior to joining NASTI, Ms. Zalaki managed the Pennsylvania Office of Developmental Programs Policy Office, developing Medicaid waiver applications, regulations, legislative analyses, and training curriculum that impacted the Pennsylvania Medicaid waivers and served as the primary contact to resolve issues with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Janine is a graduate of the Cutstown University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and psychology. So please join me in welcoming Janine. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you so much for having me to really take a walk down the history of Medicaid memory lane, as well as really to identify current policy and practice. We have a request to hold all speakers for a moment. Okay.
All right. Well, the uh, our ASL interpreter and only our ASL interpreter should be spotlighted at the moment. Uh, if anyone is still having a problem with that, please feel free to mention something and we'll figure that out. Eric, please hold. Don't don't do anything yet. Roger that. Eric, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just one second to uh, replace the spotlight here. And uh, folks, go ahead. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Take it away, really, Janine. Thank you. Really important to get that uh, straightened out. Appreciate the time for that. Um, Hi again, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I wanted to tell you that today, um, the agenda of our webinar is really to take you on a walk down the history of Medicaid, what I call memory lane, as well as identify the current policy and practice so that you have a foundational knowledge of Medicaid basics and home and community-based services. I want to give you a sense of the history and foundational pieces of Medicaid because it's really so important to not only understand where we were and how the Medicaid program grew over the years, but to connect all of the very finite pieces that make this complicated puzzle of Medicaid a whole. Next slide, please. I'm gonna cover a lot of territory. Um, I'm, gonna high, I'm gonna cover these topics at a very high level. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Medicaid facts and data. We're gonna talk a little bit about the historical perspectives and really the origins of the Medicaid program. We'll cruise on into Medicaid, the basics, um, focusing on the 1915C waiver, highlighting very quickly the eight CBS watershed regulations, and then just highlight a couple of resources for you. Next slide, please. So when I always start a presentation on Medicaid, I like to start with a little bit of humor. Um, if you're not a, a policy wonk or someone who really likes to delve into all of the Medicaid regulations and the uh, uh, waiver applications, I love to start out with this slide because it says of Medicaid, it's been said, it's not rocket science, it's far more complicated. 
Um, I know we've all been there, right? Trying to figure a piece of it out, wondering why a policy is what it is at the state level, uh, trying to navigate as a support coordinator or a family or um, a person receiving support. Um, so I'm going to tell you that once I provide you with the basics, you will have the tools that you need. Um, and it definitely and it definitely becomes less complicated. So uh, let's get right in. Next slide, please. I think one of the most important pieces to understand Medicaid is to understand the enormity of it. Um, I am a person who feels that data is power, and this Medicaid data is from the recent uh, Medicaid Annual Expenditures Report for fiscal year 2020. So I just want to highlight some of this data for you so you get an idea of um, how expansive the program is. So national Medicaid long-term services and support expenditures total $199.4 billion in federal, federal fiscal 2020, big B, with HCBS, what we're all familiar with, accounting for 124.6 of that billion. So you can see the major chunk that Medicaid um, funds. The COVID-19 public health emergency affected changes in long-term services and supports expenditures. Although it's a bit unclear how or to the extent of which, what we do know is the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to overall expenditure growth between fiscal year 2019 and 2020, um, a big jump um, in Medicaid enrollees. Spending on long-term services and supports as a share of total Medicaid expenditures has declined from 47% in 1988 to 33% in 2020. It also declined from 34% in 2019, but that was largely due to an increase in spending on beneficiaries without disabilities who do not use long-term services and supports. Another fact out of this report is that spending on nursing facility services represented the majority of institutional long-term services and support expenditures accounting for 78% of these expenditures in fiscal year 2020. The 1915C waiver program, which we're gonna talk about, um, the expenditure growth has fluctuated in the waiver programs over the last decade. Expenditures have generally increased even when in adjusted for inflation, reaching about 53.8 billion in fiscal year 2020, so spending on 1915C waiver programs really represented the largest share of HCBS expenditures. And that accounted for 43% uh, of, of the total expenditures. So just wanted to give you a little bit of baseline data on the expansiveness of the program. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna dive into that um, historical perspective that, that I mentioned and really talk about Medicaid and its origins. Next slide. So we started our Medicaid path um, in the US in 1965. But before I speak to that, I want to say that if you've ever heard of the CARES Mills Act of 1960, that provided medical assistance for uh, people who are eight in the aging program, which was really the precursor for the Medicare and Medicaid program that we know of today, and really provided a template for what today is the largest health insurance program. So, so I wanted to put that in there. We, we always jump to 1965 when the Medicaid program was authorized under Title 19 of the Social Security Act, but that CARES Mills Act really gave a glide path for it. Uh, Medicaid in 1965 was introduced by uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson, our 36th president, and really was enacted to provide health care services to low-income children, um, they said deprived of 
parental support, their caretaker relatives, the elderly, the blind, and individuals with disabilities. So it was a pretty expansive program, even back in 1965. If there's anyone on, on the webinar from Hawaii, a shout out to Hawaii, who was the first state to adopt the Medicaid uh, program. In 1967, we moved on to what we term and what you've probably heard of EPSDT, which is Early Periodic Screening and Diagnostic Testing. This is the children's health component of Medicaid. That's when it was born in 1967. EPSDT is a very comprehensive health service benefit for all Medicaid children under the age of 21. In 1971, as we continue down that road of our journey to Medicaid, uh, there was congressional authorization for intermediate care facilities for in individuals with an intellectual disability. And these, this, this was services as a state plan uh, option under Medicaid. So it allowed states to re receive federal matching funds for institutional services that had been previously funded with state or local government dollars only. Fast forwarding on in 1972, Medicaid eligibility for the elderly, people who are blind and disabled residents of a state could be linked to eligibility for the newly enacted federal SSI program if a state chose. So we're gonna continue down brings us to 1981, freedom of choice waivers, providing states with the flexibility to modify their delivery systems by allowing CMS to waive certain statutory federal requirements. Some of the things I will talk about soon are comparability, uh, statewideness, um, freedom of choice of all willing and qualified providers, and also home and community-based services, that 1915C that has a large chunk of the federal expenditures was established to meet the needs of people who prefer to receive long-term services and supports in their home or community settings rather than an institutional setting. And I have to say that this was huge and we owe all this to President Reagan and to Katie Beckett. If it wasn't for the heroism of Katie Beckett, we would not have the Medicaid program as it is today. Katie and her family went to President Reagan and said, you know, we don't understand. We wanna keep Katie at home. Why do, to receive the supports that she needs, do we have to get them from a hospital or an institution? Why can't she live at home and receive these supports? Then came the Katie Beckett waivers, so kids with intensive medical needs can get services at home as well with a income disregard. Um, so that was a major turning point and a huge opening to serve other populations that truly did not exist before in Medicaid. Uh, closing out our Medicaid early days in 1997, Congress also passed a companion to cover low-income children through a program called the Children's Health Insurance Program, which you may have heard uh, called CHIP. Some of your states operate CHIP as a part of Medicaid, while others operate it as a separate program. So that's a little bit of the history. Next slide. So why don't we move into some of the foundational pieces and the Medicaid basics. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm a very visual person and I really um, like to uh, show a graphic about, and I equate the structure of Medicaid to the growing of a tree. Um, this tree, if you're looking at it, the, the visual depicts the structure of Medicaid. The roots at the bottom of that tree are the foundations and the supporting rules and requirements. So those are all of your payment requirements, your, your, your you know, requirements for the programs. That trunk moving further up that tree is the bulk of standing the tree up, covering the benefits, including the mandatory and optional benefits 
in the state plan that we're going to talk about and the eligibility groups and other program features and requirements that we will cover. You know, that, that trunk is basically everything on who the program serves. When you get over to the right, the leaves and branches um, have the more free-flowing pieces. And by free-flowing pieces, I mean your waivers and your 1115 um, demonstrations. Um, these are all the exceptions to regular business in Medicaid and really the crux to individual uh, services and supports. Next slide, please. So you might ask yourself sometimes, you know, what is the, the Medicaid program like? You know, you've heard this term Medicaid single state agency. What, what does that mean? Um, the operation of Medicaid requires every state to have a single state agency. States must de designate a single state agency to administer or supervise the administration of the state's Medicaid plan. So states can often and oftentimes do delegate functions to other state agencies or sister state agencies like the Developmental Disability Agency, for instance, or contract with other public or private entities to perform various functions involved in the administration of the state plan. State uh, IDD agencies are often the operating agencies for state IDD Medicaid programs um, when it comes to some of the waivers. Next slide, please. So there, there's a partnership in Medicaid. Um, there, the Medicaid program is jointly financed by federal uh, centers for Medicaid and Medicaid, Medicare services and state government. So federal cont contributions are governed by the what you may have heard, you might have heard someone say FMAP, you might have heard someone say match rate. Um, what that is, is the contributions um, and how much the federal government is going to provide the state with a matching rate for your Medicaid um, expenditures. Those rates range from 50 to 82% of the state's Medicaid expenditures for services. So, you know, you might say, well, why is there a range? Um, the formula provides higher rates to states with maybe lower per capita income, and it provides lower rates to some states with a higher per capita income. Per capita income is really the average income earned per person in any given state in a specified year that's lower than the national average. So, Every state has to get at least 50%, but there are some states who are getting uh, more than 50%. Next slide, please. This is, uh, again, uh, just a quick visualization of the different amounts of money the federal gov government contributes to states' Medicaid programs. So the lighter blue shades indicate less federal match, and the darker, deep navy blue shades means the federal government contributes more um, to, to that state's Medicaid program. So just something to further um, explain the point on the last slide about how uh, the matching uh, rate is developed. Next slide, please. So I mentioned in Medicaid, there are some overarching coverage and payment requirements. And these are found in section 1902 of the Social Security Act. And I deem them the rules of the road per se. Um, and here's some key examples of the rules of the road. One is statewideness. So most Medicaid benefits must be made available on a statewide basis. But a Medicaid waiver on the other hand can allow a state to waive statewideness, for example. Due process, the right to appeal, any adverse action that's taken um, is a rule of the road for sure. That single state Medicaid agency that we talked about on a previous slide um, is another area um, that's a rule of the road. 
Anyone can make application and services must be furnished with reasonable promptness. Um, CMS does not tell a state what the reasonable promptness standard must be, um, but states can set their own reasonable promptness standards and really do. Um, they try to, whether it's 30 days or, you know, I'm just throwing a number out there, but um, reasonable promptness is a rule of the road. Free choice of all willing and qualified providers. So any provider that's willing and qualified by the state um, is a provider that's able to be chosen. For instance, if you're a waiver provider and you're a person receiving supports, you can choose from any willing and qualified provider all the time and change your providers. Um, Medicaid is the payer, oh, comparability, sorry, I jumped one. Comparability, some Medicaid benefits are available to everyone that is eligible. And we're gonna get to those, okay, in a little bit. And Medicaid is the payer of last resort, almost always. If another insurer or program or state plan uh, has, they have the responsibility to pay for costs incurred by a Medicaid eligible individual. And if there is, that entity is generally required to pay all or part of the cost of the claim prior to Medicaid making any payment. So payer of last resort, another uh, rule of the road. Next slide, please. Continuing on a bit with the overarching coverage and payment requirements, section uh, 1903A of the Social Security Act sets forth the rates of federal financing for different types of expenditures, for instance. So under that uh, 1903A, federal payment is available at the rate of which I told you, 50%, for amounts expended by a state, if they're found necessary by the secretary for the proper and efficient administration of the state plan. And I'll get into the 1950I state plan versus the 1915C waiver. Um, another requirement for payment is costs must be what CMS terms proper and efficient for the state's administration of its Medicaid state plan. And this is decided by the, the secretary of HHS. Uh, some special categories of activity are eligible for higher rates of that med federal medical assistance percentage, that FMAP. For example, uh, I mentioned nursing homes. There's a process called pre-admission screening and resident review, PASAR. Um, that is at a 75% match. Um, those activities. Uh, when someone goes into a nursing home um, and HCBS, you know, they want to make sure that's the most proper placement. They go through the PASAR process. Those activities get a 75% match. Uh, the design and development of, a, of certain information systems for the state, you can get a 75% match on those as well. So claiming an authorization uh, as well for any administrative activities to run the program, that is very is a different process um, than claiming for services. So there's service claiming and there's administrative claiming. And those two 75% rates that I talked about for PASAR and uh, the information systems is administrate as administrative claiming. So um, there's some little nuances there. I don't want to get too heavily into that, but I just wanted to highlight those for you. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about eligibility for Medicaid. Um, I noted that the original Medicaid program gave medical coverage to um, a, a, a myriad of uh, target populations and to individuals receiving cash assistance even. But over the years, eligibility has expanded to cover way more populations and states. And there's something that we say all the time that if you, if you saw a state's, one state's waiver, you saw one state's waiver. They're all very different. Um, and we'll talk about some of the reasons behind that. But today, Medicaid beneficiaries include um, 
uh, low-income families, uh, uh, pregnant women, children, uh, individuals with disabilities, uh, seniors, um, really everyone that's in need of long-term services and supports. A couple of years ago, under the Affordable Care Act, you might have heard um, that referred to as ACA, states had the option to expand their Medicaid programs to cover uh, low-income non-elderly and children or adults. Um, and as of 2022, uh, 38 states and the District of Columbia had expanded Medicaid uh, to cover this expanded population. Um, I think South Dakota was uh, recently joined in 2023. Next slide, please. So I am not, I repeat, not going to read down every mandatory eligibility group in Medicaid, but I want you to have this as a resource. There are um, mandatory Medicaid groups a state must support if they want to get funds from your state share. So no matter what state you are or what state you're from, you have to provide these Medicaid mandatory eligibility groups, okay? So as you can see, there's a, a, a many of them here. As I said, I'm not gonna read them, but you have them for your reference. These are the mandatory eligibility groups here. There are also Medicaid uh, optional eligibility groups for a state. So a state can decide if they want to provide supports to any of these mandatory eligibility groups, okay? So that's at the option of the state. The other eligibility groups, no option, have to do it. Um, so this again is for your reference. Next slide, please. This is another slide on, as you can see, there are a lot of optional eligibility groups um, that a state can provide supports for. So just as I said, that there are many, many different waivers across the country, there are many different state plans across the country when it comes to the optional eligibility groups. Next slide, please. CMS established guidelines for the Medicaid program and the Medicaid laws have set broad standards for coverage of population and offered benefits while keeping much of the program's components optional as you saw on the previous slides. So a state's flexibility is really the hallmark of the Medicaid program. Each state has the ability to tailor it within federal parameters that we mentioned to best meet the needs of its residents. As a result, as I said, Medicaid programs vary from state to state, sometimes widely. Um, so even though we can share other state practices, it's really important all the time to know, you know, what is happening in your state? Where are the gaps? What are the priorities and what are the outcomes that you, you know, the state wants to see out of the, the Medicaid program? Next slide. So just as there are Medicaid uh, mandatory eligibility groups, there are also mandatory Medicaid services. So as part of traditional Medicaid programs, each state is required to cover a set of mandatory benefits that include various medical necessary procedures and services. They're up here for you. Again, I mentioned EPSDT, mandatory benefit, um, nursing facility services, home health, family planning. So just to name a few, but this gives you an idea of the mandatory benefits in Medicaid. Next slide. In addition, states may request federal funding to expand the set of covered benefits to include all of these optional benefits. Um, you know, you're seeing physical therapy on here, you're seeing case management, you're seeing prescription drugs. Um, these are all the optional benefits in Medicaid. Um, also, but not listed here, is optional HCBS benefits. Um, 
So just, just to give you a, a general idea of what we're talking about here. Next slide. So I mentioned the early and periodic screening diagnosis and testing, which EPSDT, um, and I, I, it's really important for me to mention it again. I told you it was the child health component of Medicaid. Federal statutes and regulations state that children under the age of 21 who are enrolled in Medicaid are entitled to EPSDT benefits. And also that states must, must I say, cover a broad array of preventative and treatment services. So when it comes to kids under 21, remember those two slides on the mandatory and optional benefits that I talked about? When it comes to kids, even if your state isn't providing one of those optional benefits, if a kid needs it, it must be provided. So EPSDT is an entitlement. Um, and up on the screen, you have what those letters stand for. Early, really assess, assessing and identifying problems early. Uh, periodic, checking children's health at periodic age-appropriate intervals. To make sure that they're on track and doing terrific. Um, screening, providing physical, mental, developmental, dental, hearing, vision. All of those screening tests to detect if there are any potential problems. Um, that need to be ameliorated so that child um, you know, can hear better or can see better or et cetera. So you know, EPSDT is really getting a spotlight now too from the pandemic um, because CMS actually hired a contractor recently to go, to go out to states, to look at all the states across the country to determine you know, how are they using the EPSDT EPSDT benefits before they use waiver services. Because remember I, I mentioned the um, payer of last resort? So EPSDT benefits entitlement under a state plan come before waiver services. So, um, you know, this is something that uh, the feds are, are starting to really look into. Next slide, please. I mentioned the pre-admission screening and resident review. I also want to go in a tiny bit deeper on this so that you have a good understanding of it because it, it's a real important aspect of Medicaid. PASAR was created in 1987 as part of the nursing home reform uh, through language in the Omnibus Budget Reconcil Reconciliation Act, which we all know as OBRA 87. Uh, PASAR is very unique within Medicaid in that the statute obligates the state ID and um, mental illness agencies, uh, as well as the Medicaid agencies, to perform certain functions. PASAR requires that every applicant that is going to a Medicaid certified nursing facility, that those applicants are evaluated for uh, either a serious mental illness or an intellectual disability be offered the most appropriate setting for their needs. So it doesn't have to be the nursing facility in the community or acute care setting or whatever um, is best and most appropriate and receive the services they need in those settings. So this is a very, very important function for uh, state IDB agencies. Next slide, please. There is an in, um, intersection of uh, interaction, intersection, whatever word you want to use, um, between Medicaid and Medicare. Many individuals with IDB uh, supported by state agencies also have Medicare. Um, we call these folks dual eligibles. There are more than 9 million dual eligibles in the United States. There is another you know, uh, light shining upon dual eligibles to make sure that states understand this interaction. There are people who qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid. 
And a lot of times uh, these individuals might be low income seniors or people under age 65 who have a disability and you want them to have the benefits of both programs. Uh, individuals receive acute primary and pharmacy coverage from Medicare because remember Medicaid is the payer of last resort and really does not cover much HCBS Medicare or long-term services and supports uh, to date. There are different parts of Medicare um, that help cover specific, specific services. You might have heard people say, oh, well, that's Medicare Part A. Uh, Medicare Part A is hospital insurance. Someone might be like, well, that's Medicare Part B. Um, that's uh, medical insurance. And they might say, well, that's Medicare Part D. And Part D is prescri prescription drug coverage. So there's different parts of uh, Medicare and it's, it's important to know the interactions with uh, Medicaid. So I wanted to mention that to you as well. Next slide. So before we talk about the 1915C waiver, we talked about um, a state plan as an entitlement. Um, Medicaid section 1915I HCBS is our state plan options. Um, I'm gonna briefly mention a little bit about the state plan. So states can amend their state plans to offer home and community-based services as I, no as I noted before, as an optional state plan benefit. Um, they may have multiple uh, state plan amendments going on at the same time. You might have heard them referred to as I-SPAs. But the important thing to remember about a 1915 I state plan option is that it totally breaks the eligibility link between HCBS and institutional care. So what I mean by that is, a person is receiving state plan services, they don't have to meet an institutional level of care like you do in a waiver. It is, it has to be less stringent and it's really based on needs-based criteria. So it opens up the doors to more people because it's less stringent than that institutional level of care. And again, it's based on state set needs-based criteria. Also, another important point to, to know about a 1915I is you can't limit the number of individuals that are being supported. Like you, you can in a 1915C waiver, you say for waiver year one, the unduplicated number of participants is X. For year two, because there's five years in a waiver. For year two, it's this. For year three, it's this many. Um, in a 1915I, the, the, the doors are open. If you meet the needs-based criteria, you get the services, okay? So that would be the, the biggest differences that I would uh, mention to you all. Next slide, please. So let's move into focusing on the most common Medicaid benefit important to people with disabilities, people who are aging, um, uh, people who, who may have an acquired brain injury, it is the 1915C Medicaid waiver. 1915C is by far the most common of the waivers throughout use across the country. Um, I think at last count, don't quote me on it, but there was like 300 and some waivers across the country, probably more by now, but um, there's also a whole alphabet soup of Medicaid authorities that we won't even get to because we only have an hour, but you might have heard them as J, K, Community First Choice, you know. Um, but uh, most importantly and most used is a 1915C. So we're going to spend our time on it today. Next slide. As I stated on our walk down uh, Medicaid memory lane, uh, the 1915C waiver allows states to offer an array of HCBS as an alternative to institutional services. Um, the correcting the institutional bias, if you think about it, what I said about Katie Beckett was that individuals could get support services while in institutions, but again, not in their communities. So 
the idea is that states can use the Medicaid money for community services that would have been used for the person in an institution. Hence, you have to meet institutional level of care. But it broke that um, institutional bias in Medicaid. Thus, getting a waiver is tied to, again, that institutional eligibility. This does not mean that you have to go to an institution or even want to go or even have it in your mind's eye, just that you could be eligible for services in an institution. Section 1915C of the Social Security Act also allows states to ask for waivers of, remember those Medicaid rules of the road that I noted? A waiver, you can ask for waivers of certain pieces of that. Um, so again, like statewideness or comparability. Um, so that's why uh, you call these waivers. Next slide, please. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, provides states with uh, a web-based application that they fill out in the waiver format or template. Um, the state will fill this template out in their system, submit the plan to CMS. Because the waiver is a Medicaid program, remember that single state agency I talked about, they submit the application. But another agency like maybe uh, your division of, of uh, IDD reviews and approves the application, you know, and this goes on sometimes after considerable uh, negotiation. This slide gives, gives you kind of uh, a, a little graphic on when you submit, submit your initial application, then CMS has, you know, you really submit it 24 months before the expiration date of that waiver, every waiver has an expiration date. So the state 24 months before it expires has to get everything ready, send it out for public comment, make sure it's ready to go to CMS. Um, they have to uh, put, send in 372, they call it submissions. It's a lot of data about the program. Um, then it goes to CMS review. So there's a, a process that states have to go through. Um, to really get these waivers renewed. When you first, um, when waivers are first approved, they're approved for a three-year period. And then after that, they're approved for five-year period. So that doesn't mean that a state can't make changes to it through an amendment, but the renewals are done on that five-year period. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about the CMS review process so that we can have a little bit of sympathy <laughs> for those in the state who have this job. I had it, um, so that's why I'm uh, really sympathetic of the people who, who have the job because when a state wants to develop a new waiver, the state submits the waiver application to CMS again after that very comprehensive stakeholder engagement and public input process that was also um, defined in that more, more uh, in depthly, I should say, in the HCBS regulation. So states submit waiver applications, again, using that system. They're assigned an analyst. They will use the instructions and the CMS technical guide. And that baby is like 400 pages long or more, <laughs> 10 appendices. So that's where the sympathy part comes from. Um, state submit waiver applications. That 90-day clock begins for CMS to start reviewing. And then, like I said, there may be a lot of back and forth um, until that waiver is finally approved. And CMS also wants to see all of that stakeholder engagement public input process information. Next slide, please. When it comes to waiver services, states have full discretion to design their service array. So remember the state plan services and there's those mandatory services and mandatory eligibility groups. That's, that's not the way it is in a waiver. States have full discretion to design their service array. There are a few types of services allowable in waivers. 
Um, the first is what is deemed as statutory services. And these include all of your core service descriptions in the 1915C waiver technical guide. These are services that are specifically authorized or otherwise, otherwise included in 1915C of the Act, as long as the state's specified scope of the service aligns with those core service definitions. That is considered a statutory service. There are other services, and these are deemed as really a state can request to offer other services that are not expressly authorized in the statute. Um, it, it, it can be demonstrated, if it can be demonstrated, I should say, that the services will be necessary to assist a waiver participant to avoid institutionalization and function in the community. Many states have been um, adding housing and tenancy supportive services, and that's that services in the other service category, just to give you an example. Um, the third type of waiver service is the extended state plan services. So, you know, I had uh, put up the mandatory benefits um, and some of the optional benefits, say, for instance, uh, some of the therapies a state may augment the services that it provides under the state plan in their waiver. So the services cannot duplicate what's provided under the state plan, but if the state wants to sort of um, enhance the amount or duration or the frequency of the state plan service, um, they can do that by saying they're gonna offer uh, those as extended state plan services in the waiver. So by doing that, they're different and they could be uh, sort of more than what's medically necessary in the state plan, if that makes sense, under the medically necessary criteria. So those are the three different types of services that you'll see in a waiver. And as I noted, waivers across the country are very, very different. Um, it's always exciting to jump in on one, um, see what a state's providing, uh, learn some lessons learned, um, et cetera. Next slide. A uh, uh, wonderful thing about um, Medicaid waivers is, and in the state plan, you can do that too, but um, offering self-direction in the Medicaid waiver. Uh, participant direction, as it's called um, in the technical guide, I always call it self-direction. Um, it means that the waiver participant has the authority to exercise that decision-making authority over some or all of their waiver services and really accepts the responsibility for taking a direct role in managing um, those services. So this is called employer authority. Uh, participants may also have decision-making authority over the Medicaid funds in a budget and how they're spent. And this is referred to as budget authority. So participant direction is not a separate program on its own within a waiver. Uh, the state in that waiver application identifies what services they're gonna check off out of the array that can be self-directed, okay? Um, Participant direction is an alternative to provider management of services. Uh, and what I mean by that is where a service provider has the responsibility for managing all the aspects of service delivery. They're hiring their workers, they're firing their workers. Um, you know, they're implementing those services as directed in the person-centered service plan. If you're self-directing your services, you do that yourself with the help of a representative, and you have a financial management service organization that helps you pay your workers. Um, participant direction promotes personal choice and control over the delivery of waiver services, um, including who provides them and how they're delivered. Um, for example, the participant uh, may be afforded the opportunity to be supported, you know, as I noted, to recruit and hire and supervise all of their workers, say what kind of training they need, um, terminate the employer uh, uh, employee um, if they're not performing in a satisfactory manner to them. Um, when a waiver services provider managed, a provider selected by the participant really carries out those responsibilities. 
So in incorporating participant direction into a waiver um, involves a couple dimensions that I noted. Um, and a waiver may permit participants to self-direct some or all of the services. Um, or some uh, self-direction programs have another piece called agency with choice, where it's just a little bit of a different model where uh, you can say to agency A, I'd like to hire you know, my neighbor or whomever, and they do more of the heavy lifting for you. But um, it's a, a wonderful program and uh, it's a program that we have to um, look at access issues on. Um, Self-direction, I have to say, is basically a white middle-class program. Uh, we really need to look at access issues for everyone um, so they have access to this program. So uh, just something uh, I wanted to know. Next slide, please. We're going to move into some other important pieces of a waiver, uh, what CMS calls waiver assurances. So every HCBS authority, no matter what one it is, has quality expectations. So by its nature, the term assurance refers to the floor, the minimum guarantees for quality. You know, what are the minimum standards for quality that must be met? So in every waiver, there are six assurances in that waiver from the feds. The first one is administrative authority. So remember that state Medicaid agency, and they have ultimate authority and responsibility for the operation of that program by exerting oversight. That's Appendix A, and there are performance measures that a state has to develop to meet that assurance. So for instance, I told you you can contract with some other government agents to do some work. So if they, the Medicaid agency delegates a certain function to the um, you know, the IDD agency. They might have a performance measure, making sure that the IDD agency is doing what they need to do, you know, for that administration of the program. The second uh, assurance is level of care. The state has to demonstrate that it implements the processes and instruments specified in the waiver, the approved waiver, for evaluating and then re-evaluating that a person is eligible for the waiver, okay? Um, and that level of care, as I said, is consistent with a hospital, a nursing facility, or an ICF IID. Um, the next measure, assurance, is qualified providers. I mentioned to you about all willing and qualified providers. So the state demonstrates that it designed and implemented an adequate system for assuring that all waiver providers are qualified, okay? The next one is service plan. This is a big one. Um, the state de designs and implements an effective system for reviewing the adequacy of service plans for waiver participants. And there are a couple measures um, under that one. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I gave you a link there where you'll find the CMS guidance and in detail on all these assurances. Um, most important, health and welfare. On an ongoing basis, the state identifies, addresses, and seeks to prevent instances of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. You'll find a lot of incident management measures in there as well. And finally, the last assurance is financial accountability. No less important, right? The state has financial oversight um, to assure that all of the claims for services are paid for in accordance with the reimbursement methodology specified in that waiver application. So that's in Appendix I. It describes, uh, you describe, the state describes the methodology for services. Um, and how they're going to be paid. So whether you have a, a fee schedule, you know, so that is all in that appendix. So CMS, though, uh, recently, um, you may have, have heard, sent out a Medicaid director letter, I think it was about last summer, talking about this a set of nationally standardized quality measures 
for Medicaid funded HCBS that is really intended to promote more common and consistent use within and across states on these nationally standardized quality measures in HCBS programs. A lot of the current waiver assurances deal a lot with process, okay? Things that the state has to do all the time. CMS, through the HCBS regulations, as we know, is really concerned about what people's experiences are. So this standardized measure set is gonna get at that and it's gonna be less of an administrative burden on reporting things that I said, the state has to sure, anyway, state has to make sure someone's qualified before they start waiver services. They gotta make sure they're continually qualified. They're gonna be doing that. Why are they reporting on that when they could be reporting out on something else that gets at a person's experience? So, um, CM CMS plans to incorporate the use of these measures into the reporting requirements for specific Medicaid authorities and programs. Um, they're starting with Money Follows the Person and Section 1115 demonstrations that include HCBS, but they're going to be requiring it for everybody else. Um, uh, check out the access rule when it's out in its final form, uh, supposedly sometime this month. Next slide, please. The state must also describe um, in each of those appendices that I just went over, those waiver assurances, who does what, and also how the state will meet all those requirements of the HCBS waiver program. And remember, I talked about that 372. They got to give that data. They got to, CMS will do a quality report. They got to give data on the measures. Um, so the performance measures on all of those key assurances and sub-assurances that the state has to agree to, um, that is their quality improvement strategy. This in includes describing the methods for discovering if the state is meeting the requirement, they call that discovery. It also includes the data collection. Uh, what, what does the sampling look like? Is it 100% of waiver participants? Is it not? Um, how are you going to analyze and demonstrate compliance with the assurances? If you find something, how are you going to remediate that issue that you find found once it's discovered? What are the system improvements? It's that continuous quality cycle um, that CMS is concerned about. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the HCBS regulations, but this was such a watershed regulation that I would be remiss if I didn't uh, highlight some of the uh, most important pieces, according to myself. Um, so the first has to do with setting. Um, when the waiver program started in 1981, any setting that wasn't in an institution was like, you know, fantastic. This is where we want to move, home and community-based services. Fast forward, every setting in, a, in the community is not community from CMS's perspective. They want to look at these settings more in, in, intently. They want to know, hey, do these are these settings integrated in and do they support access to the greater community? Do these settings provide opportunities to seek employment, work in competitive integrated settings, all words in this red, engage in community life and, con and you know, control personal resources, ensure that the, the person receives services in the community, the biggest bar, to the same degree of access as anybody else not receiving Medicaid. Um, the setting is selected by the person. Wherever they live is selected by them from among a bunch of different options that are non-disability specific settings, you know, an apartment, wherever they want, a house, you know, a private unit, whatever, a roommate, uh, anything, but it's, it's the person's choosing of that setting. So that is setting highlight requirements. Continuing on, next slide. Um, you know, has to ensure an individual's right of privacy and dignity and respect and freedom from coercion and restraint. 
these tenants obviously are basic human rights. And CMS, when they uh, extended the implementation of the HCBS regs, they made sure, right? Because the pandemic, I know, turned the system on its head, you know, uh, state systems and providers and everybody was saying, you know, oh, I don't know if I can meet some of these tenants of this reg because of, you know, what's happening and the direct support workforce shortage. But CMS said, you know what? Ensuring the individual's rights to privacy, dignity, respect, freedom from coercion, restraint, optimizing autonomy and independence and choices. That all has to be done. We're not, we're not giving anybody a corrective action plan on any of that. Um, ensuring people are not isolated or prevented in some ways of, to have access to their communities. So all really, really important aspects of uh, individuals having an everyday life. Um, Next slide. Person-centered planning, one of my favorite topics. Um, something that we've been doing for years, right? A lot of years. Um, some doing it really well, maybe some not, but CMS took note of that. And the HCBS regulations for the first time codified person-centered planning. It was a long time coming. Uh, the rule describes the minimum requirements for the person-centered service plan, including the process uh, results of the plan. Risks are identified, preferences. Um, I'm not going to cover every single aspect, um, but it's, it's critically important. CMS is going out to states right now and doing health and welfare visits and making some uh, serious notations about person-centered planning and, and if there's a lack thereof and if the requirements in the HCBS settings rule are not, um, you know, being adhered to, you know, are people honoring the choices and input of people in their own plans? Um, you know, are they, is, are people getting necessary information to make an informed choice, having experiences to make those informed choices to the maximum extent possible? So, um, you know, person-centered planning is, is definitely the foundation of, of our system. And as I said, something that the, the federal government is now really um, looking into even more since the HCBS regs were finalized. Now, this was effective as of 3-17-2014. There, there wasn't a couple years out implementation for person-centered planning. So, uh, you know, 2014 to 2024, if they're not seeing exactly the kind of progress that they want to see, um, we'll have to see what else comes out on person-centered planning. Next slide. Case management and conflict of interest is part of these regs um, that were effective 3-17-2014. The most important thing to, to think about here is providers of HCBS for the person or those who have an interest in or are employed by a provider of HCBS for that person must not provide case management or develop that person-centered plan because there is an inherent conflict of interest. Now, if your state can prove that there's an only willing and qualified entity to provide case management in a certain area, they may get a dispensation from CMS, but it's really hard to get. And um, there's a lot of different uh, requirements there. So um, anyways, in these cases, the states must divide conflict of interest protections that really make sure, again, that that person has an alternative dispute resolution process for things they're not happy with. Uh, next slide, please. I want to tell you that Medicaid program integrity expert expectations keep on growing and growing. Um, CMS, the Office of Inspector General, the, the Governor's Accountability Office are very much keenly interested and concerned with program integrity efforts in Medicaid. Combating fraud, waste, and abuse, ensuring individuals are free from abuse, neglect, and exploitation, high priority. Um, looking at improper payments in Medicaid and states, um, you know, making sure states are accountable and transparent. Um, so anyway, CMS has a whole unit um, that talks and looks at the financial management of, of state fiscal practices. 
remember um, that Appendix I that I talked about, um, making sure their strong stewardship of public funds. Next slide, please. This is just a, a graphic. I know I'm, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, this is just a graphic on improper payments. Uh, CMS had that heightened focus on reducing errors, and the biggest errors were in eligibility determination. So um, that's a big contributor about, resulted in about $2.7 billion in Medicaid costs and about 500 million in questionable reimbursement. So, you know, what comes with Medicaid is also fiscal responsibilities. Um, so I just wanted to point that out to you. All right, I'm at the end. Um, I so appreciate your patience in all of that information. Um, I have the website medicaid.gov there. Um, on that website, you're gonna find um, some some really important informational materials that will, will guide the Medicaid program and all the changes that have happened throughout the years. One is the Social Security Act in general. Um, any regulations, like the HCBS regulations have their own page. Any laws passed by Congress and, and that are published in the Federal Register, for example, um, the new 1915C technical guide is out in the Federal Register right now for public comment. Any state Medicaid director letters that go out, and these letters really further clarify and communicate policies that are set forth in regulations. Because as you know, regulations are at the high level. Um, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, uh, you got to look into some of the state Medicaid director uh, letters that clarify statutory and regulatory issues. Uh, CMS informational bulletins um, also provide further guidance. I mentioned that 1915C technical guide, that's there. So um, I know it's not the easiest of sites to maneuver, but if you go into that HCBS section, um, you will get to frequent it. Um, I'm there on a daily basis. So again, thank you so much for your time. Um, I would be delighted to take some questions, and uh, I really appreciate your patience as I went through all of that information. I am, I don't know, I'm going to look through the chat now because it was as I was yeah. presenting, I was not. I, mean, <laughs> I yeah. can. Um... Feed you some questions if that works. Perfect. All right, give me one second. Yeah. All right, let's start from the top. There's lots of questions. Um, okay, and and you can tell me too if these are questions you can put. Uh, you can answer if we we might need yeah. to follow up with folks. Um, so someone says I am having trouble understanding the EPST SDT used before waiver services, isn't it all out of the same money in Medicaid having trouble understanding how it would be a payer of last resort? So, um, great question, thank you. Uh, remember when I, uh, let's go back to a little bit of the slide and maybe this will help. The slide that I had up on the mandatory benefits and the optional benefits in Medicaid state plan. Okay, and remember the difference in Medicaid state plan is it's less stringent um, criteria to be eligible than it is in a waiver. So for EPSDT, any person uh, under the age of 21, it, they're entitled to get any of those mandatory and optional benefits out of Medicaid. And they just, they have to get them first because Medicaid is the payer of last resort, the Medicaid waiver is. So the 1915I state plan, because they're an entitlement, people need to go there first. And it's important and a, and a good thing because you might be on a, a waiting list for Medicaid waiver services, and you were able to get some of these services that you need from the 1915I state plan especially for kids, that's an entitlement. So 
I, I hope that's helpful a little bit um, in that explanation. If I could do anything further or have a, a chat with you, just you know, put your contact information in the chat. I'd be happy to. Awesome. And then we have another question. How would you find a list of the activities that CMS will pay for under HCBS? I'm trying to find out how CMS defines residential habilitation. Oh, good question too. Um, while I'm talking here, let me bring up and I'll put the link in the chat. The 1915 C technical guide that I'm referencing uh, has every single uh, core service and optional service. I'm gonna put this in the chat for you, including, this is gonna go to everyone. Yes, okay, there you go. Um, there you go including um, a definition of residential services. Now, I do want to caution you that, as I noted, states can sort of uh, make subtle changes to that core definition. So you may see a little bit of variation, but the core tenets of it um, will still be applicable, if that makes sense. Um, if you go to this technical guide, I will tell you that um, starting on give you a frame of reference here. The core services are on page 153. Okay. So if you want to jump to the services, um, you know, the descriptions of the core extended state plan, go to 153 of that document and that will get you there quicker, okay? All right, so we probably have uh, time for one more question before closing um, and I'm kind of, there's so many good questions, so I'm just picking them randomly, just to be fair. <laughs> um, is there any expectation that those who facilitate person-centered planning actually have training credentials? Often support coordinators are not skilled in this process and don't dedicate enough time to do it well. What a great question and what great timing, I may add. Um, I mentioned to you all that the, that this technical guide that I have on the in the chat, that a, a newer version is out for public comment right now. And, with, and this is the second time. Within that document, it's now states that case, CMS has never told states what type of training case managers have to have, never, okay? States can set their own qualifications, et cetera. But in this new version of the technical guide, they say they must be trained on person-centered planning and HCBS regulations. So when that becomes, you know, when that, when we're finished with the next iteration of the comments and this comes out, as final, it made the first cut. I don't see why it wouldn't make the second, but I think because I told you CMS went around and was, was really looking at in their health and welfare visits, the person-centered planning, um, they, they realized really quickly that uh, case managers have to be armed with the training to do this well, so. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all these questions, but we did capture them and save them. Uh, so um, we could see if, you know, you can always connect with us. And I think uh, Janine, you provided your contact info. Um, we greatly appreciate uh, your time. I know that was a lot of information, but really valuable. Um, and we're here to support from both Nickel and uh, NACDD. Um, and I just wanted to invite anyone, any other panelists, if they wanted to mention any other sign offs, or if not, we will end. Awesome. All right. Well, I hope everyone has a great rest of your evening, and thanks for participating. Bye-bye.